Good now and um, welcome to, I, I don't even know what hour this is. Hey Carl, good to see you. Uh, welcome to the Microsoft 365 Virtual Marathon. Uh, Carl, if you can just do an audio check and make sure that you can hear me. If you can just send me a message and say that you can hear me, that'll be great. We should be good. OK, let's carry on. I can close this window and not worry about the stream working because I'm assuming the stream is working. Uh, OK, it is and my iPad is actually finally caught up and I'm going to switch that off. Well, yes, I think we are on hour 12 of uh, this 36 hour marathon and I'm very excited to be here. Um, and this quite fantastic, loud and clear, awesome. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about Microsoft Information Protection. Um, there are quite a few sessions on information protection and protection in the cloud. Uh, today I'm going to focus a little bit more on what uh, Drew and uh, Michael Knoll was alluding to last night. So just a, a few um, house rules. One, the SharePoint conference has now moved and they've also changed their name and it's called the Microsoft 365 Collaboration Conference. And once we are through this epidemic or pandemic called, called COVID, um, we are hopefully going to have a conference in person. So I'm very excited about that. Um, we missed this year's one and I'm hoping to be there next year. And obviously this event cannot be made possible without our really cool, generous sponsors. I mean, you see Navpoint in there, we've got Digraph for the BI stuff. Uh, there's a bit of Valo and a bit of Quizcom and also CoreView and Perficient. So thanks very much. Give them a great shot at, um, why are my slides advancing automatically? Um, that's quite interesting. Anyhow, let's carry on. I will worry about this. Uh, next up, there is a raffle that's currently happening. Um, have a look at some of the vendors, look at these sessions, watch out and uh, submit your answers to enter the raffle. Um, there's a guideline online and um, also you're going to need at least five and it's only in America's APAC and EMEA. I actually just want to... Um, this thing is actually going automatically. That's interesting. Let's just leave it there. So let's get into to some of the meat. Before we get into the meat, 10% um, of the funds from sponsors go to support community relief. If you need to find out some more information or you would like to consider donating to these charities, please have a look at the links. Um, the Bitly links will actually come through. So a little bit about me. My name is Alistair Pugin. Uh, I look after a cloud business at uh, Tangent Solutions in sunny South Africa. Um, I, I, I write for a, a medium publication called Regarding 365 and I do a few other things. If you want to hit me up after this, uh, please find me on Twitter, probably the easiest way, at Alistair Pugin. And um, I'm happily engage with you. And, and if you've got any questions around that, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to, to have this conversation with you. Moving along, I think let's just jump into what we're really going to be talking about before we drop down. A lot of organizations that have moved to the cloud are, are, are talking about things like encryption and data loss and, and, and all of those things. So today we're really going to cover four, four things. One, I want to talk a bit about protecting your content from deletion, and that lends itself to the conversation around data loss prevention. Uh, compliance is, is becoming a big thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at the cloud adoption framework from Microsoft and a lot of the blueprints and landing zones actually talk to compliance. So if you are in FinTech, you would go and, and do a, a PCI DSS blueprint and so forth, so forth. On. Um, if you look at HIPAA and GDPR and a few other things like FedRAMP in the US, I don't know where everyone is on this call, but those are the sort of standards that you can actually adhere to when moving your environment to a platform like Azure. Today, we're really going to focus on the Microsoft 365 side of things. Now, once you're compliant, there's also things that you can do around e-discovery, specifically around litigation, when you start worrying about not being compliant or you're worrying about threats inside of your organization. And last but not least, I want to talk about, and this has come up more and more now that everyone is working from home, which is currently our new normal, 
uh, around how do you manage access to your information. Uh, Michael Knoll last night was talking about um, phishing scams and, and, and all of those things and how to make sure that your environment is actually locked down correctly and without restricting usage from your users. And uh, I always talk about uh, if someone is sitting at a coffee shop in the Ukraine, um, are you going to allow them access to your perimeter network? And speaking about perimeter networks, this is pretty much what we've had in the past, right? You've had users sitting inside of your organization. They come to the physical office and they're connecting to your data center in the building, right? I mean, that's 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 what we've had in the past. But in today's world, it's it's quite different. The world is different. And at the rate at which data is growing, uh, it's, the numbers are actually staggering about how much data we've actually created over the last five years versus the amount of data we've created over the last 55 years. And it's actually quadrupling every five years. And this is where we are sitting today. We've got these silos of information where content is stored, accessed, reused, and also collaborated on top of. And how do we securely manage our environment when it comes to that? Because for the most part, our content is actually no longer in that data center, in and that building, secured via bricks and mortar, and we've got a, a firewall in place that opens and closes ports. So how do we go about making sure that we are actually secure in the cloud? Uh, two, three years ago, when Microsoft started this journey on how to get into information protection, um, we had various silos. We had Office 365 information protection, which which everyone should be exposed to now. And it's the, the one that we're going to talk about how well they've actually grown up. And naturally, Microsoft has once again changed the naming conventions for these things. It's now called Microsoft 365 information protection, not Office. They're dropping the, the Office uh, prefix and they're just confusing everyone again. And then for those that actually manage desktops, we've gone down to Windows Defender and how do we manage the desktop as well from a threat protection perspective. And then the third pillar here was Azure IP. And I think everyone's everyone has had some sort of smell of AIP in the form of information rights management or AD RMS. In the old days, you could actually deploy RMS as a feature inside of your Windows Server 2008 box as a feature inside of your domain controller or put it onto your domain controller. And that's the world we had. So we used Office 365 information protection to manage emails because everything sat in there and it sat as part of the apps and services portfolio. And then when we pushed that down to, to talk to the desktop, we started using Intune and then the other one was the AIP portal with unified labeling. And what we have today really is the merge of all of those things and we're starting to see it come through. Big investments and announcements were made at Ignite last year and we're starting to see that in the security and compliance centers which have now been split. So where Microsoft is going with this is to give organizations a single pane of glass when it comes to managing information and the protection and the preservation of said information inside of your organization. One portal. And what we've seen over the last, I'd probably say about six months, Microsoft started talking about unified labeling from the Azure. Sorry, did someone just pop up? Um, I see a new face. Anyhow, uh, Microsoft started talking about the movement of information protection labeling from AIP into the security center in Office 365 using sensitivity labeling, and we've seen that come to fruition now. And I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in the new world and how we access the new uh, security center as well as the compliance center and what the logical split is when we actually look at that. Now, it's not only about sensitivity labeling, it's about understanding what's available to you. And this is a great slide, and I'll probably stick these slides up on the slide share uh, later today, or I'll get these slides over to the conference organizers so you can actually have a look at this. And actually, when we start looking at the set of capabilities, most organizations that move to the cloud, specifically on the Colab side, when you're doing mail, social chat, and file, we, we start looking at 
typical things like how do I encrypt email, right? Because everyone works with email. But the extensibility of what's available to you currently inside of the M365 admin center is not just about mail. And a lot of customers out there, when I speak to them, they tell me, well, they've moved to the cloud. What? You know, the question is, what? why are you in the cloud? What, what are you doing in the cloud? Well, we've got mail and we've got Office. I say, what do you mean by Office? No, well, we're using Office Pro Plus. And they forget about moving their file shares and they forget about looking at SharePoint, OneDrive plan and all the other tools that's available to you. And they forget about locking that down because they think if they enable message encryption in Outlook or in Exchange, that's what it does. Now, it's one thing enabling these things. It's another thing being able to report on it. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, I've got a customer that has recently been hacked. Well, when I say hacked, what happened was uh, the secretary got an email from her school, a child's school, and there was an attachment. It was an HTML that popped up with the Office 360 portal.office.com login details, and she logged in there. And naturally, we got a flag saying, hey, this is a, a high-risk sign-in. And what we had to do there is roll out MFA and the baseline security protection policies and making sure that modern auth is disabled because that's how people get in and they stay in. Now, that's important. So if you are, it's one thing enabling Office 365 message encryption. It's another thing being able to report on that. We're going to talk a bit about that now. Actually, moving on, what you want to do, there's a few steps around that. You want to make sure that you are able to protect across everything that you have. So securing the desktop from a device perspective, making sure that the applications that your users have access to is also protected, as well as extending that to your on-premises environment, because hybrid is not a journey. It's a, well, hybrid's an end state. It's not a, it's not a journey. Uh, some customers, we've got quite a few of these customers that there are things that you can't move to the cloud and it either goes to some form of private cloud or it stays on-prem and it's making sure that you are also protect that investment. So where do we start? Where do we go when this comes up? Now, how do we protect the content? I think that's 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 the first uh, stab I'd like to, to, to walk you through. How do we protect content wherever it is? Because gone are the days we are, we are wanting to consolidate our content and put it into a SharePoint environment on-prem. Even Gartner and AIM have said, enterprise content management is dead, long live content services, and Microsoft has actually got a content services program because we want to touch where the data is, not try to move the data to a single, a single point of entry. We want to protect where the data is. So when we start looking at protecting, right, the first thing we want to do is we want to look at what's available from a protection perspective. Now, Microsoft has got a unified approach in this, and there's two ways of protecting content inside of the organization. One, it's based on sensitivity. So is that data sensitive? So what can we do with sensitive data? Well, for starters, we can encrypt it, right? Not just encrypting mail. We can actually encrypt that object, that document that you're working with. And then we can also do things like restricting access, applying a header and a footer saying this is confidential, this might be a draft document, and so forth, so on. And we can also apply some sort of protection to that document, which I will talk about in a bit. The next thing we want to do is we want to make sure that documents don't get deleted. So how do we apply retention policies and use that as part of a data loss prevention policy inside of the organization? And lastly, we want to be able to provide mechanisms for measuring and monitoring what actually happens when we actually protect using sensitivity labeling or using retention labeling inside of your organization. And this extends across the environment. So it's not just a purvey of an attachment in a mail or, or things like that. Now, let's have a look at what sensitivity labeling actually does give you. One, you can protect the container. You can also protect the content of the container. You can also protect the object, the specific document, when you're looking at it just at a document level. So you can apply a policy for that to say, well, this document cannot be printed. It's confidential. This document cannot be sent via email, and this document cannot be edited. So you can't use a snipping tool to get the content out of that. And what you can do with that, you can also use the data loss prevention to make sure that that document is retained 
in another silo, even though the user has deleted, because you can actually go back in and make sure that even though the user has deleted that specific document, you can still keep that document for referential integrity. And there's a few ways of doing it. One, there's a manual process around the user gets to apply the sensitivity label or with an additional license plan because that's how everything works with Microsoft. You pay more for, for fancy features. You can now apply a, a automatically apply the label based on a specific condition. Now, when we actually look at how that works is let's say someone adds a credit card number or a social security number or in South Africa an ID number to a document and we deem that that document is highly confidential and it should not be shared externally. We can auto label that based on content being used inside of the document. In the old days, we used to think that if we create a PDF of the document, the, doc is not, the document is not editable. Um, that's not the case. We can extend that security down to a Word document, an Excel document, a PowerPoint document, as well as a, a, a Word, PowerPoint, Excel, as well as the Adobe documents that you have inside of your organization. And it doesn't have to be done at a container level, where it doesn't have to be in OneDrive, it doesn't have to be in SharePoint, it doesn't have to be in Teams. This can exist when someone actually starts working with the document straight off the bat. So when they open up that document, wherever they create their documents from, they'll have the facility to, to work through that and you can apply that label based on where how and how they logging in with Office. So it actually extends to the Office desktop client as well as working with Office in the cloud. Uh, what's cool about this is you can get some uh, analytics based on the labels that have been applied so you can track the usage of labels inside of your organization. You can also track where those labels are when you start looking at location. And this is good for, for your security officers when they actually need to have a look at what's going on and you can build out your sensitivity labeling and your retention labeling plans around where the content resides and also who's using what and then improve it. And we'll talk about some tips around how to roll out sensitivity labeling and retention labeling inside of your organization. This is another dashboard and I like this one because this actually extends to um, what you have on prem and you'll notice uh, in the slide it's actually looking at a file server on prem. So you can extend this and it's no longer in preview. This is just an old slide. When you start looking at Azure information protection versus sensitivity labeling inside of the M365 Security Center. Now we do talk about unified labeling and this is actually extends it to on-prem. You can actually deploy the AIP scanner on-prem at your file server and based on the policies that you created around labeling, it will actually do a scan for you and it will pick up these things and you can actually apply this and extend it to working with your on-premises investment. So before you actually move your files from your file share to the cloud, be it into some sort of Azure file storage, because you still want to map it back as a network drive, because you still want to just rehost what you have, or you're moving it to SharePoint or you actually moving it to the specific user's OneDrive as well. You've got an option to scan before you move. And it's important. I mean, sometimes you want to keep a file share on-prem for whatever the reason, but you just want to start using OneDrive in the cloud so that you can actually have your users use OneDrive and share from that. Um, you can have the best of both worlds using AIP plus the Microsoft 365 Security Center's sensitivity and classification schemas around sensitivity labeling as well as retention labeling. This is just a view on what information protection looks like in the new compliance center, which is important for some, some people that are, might be on the call. Um, the topics that we're covering is, is, is quite condensed here and I don't have enough time. This I usually do this over a, a four hour period during a workshop. But what's nice about this is when you start looking at auto labeling, you can actually pull this through in the new compliance center so you can see what you're adhering to. And we'll talk about a security baseline um, when we get to that section in the deck. So just a few slides on what to look at. A lot of times we get false positives coming through and it's important to understand how this impacts. So if you create a condition that says, if I find a 13 digit numeric value in a document, 
I'm going to classify it as an identity number because in South Africa it's a 13 digit number, but anyone can put a 13 digit number in a document. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is actually an ID number or social security number. And that's where false positives come in and something that you're going to have to review and you're going to have to have someone worrying about security in your organization because some documents you might apply a protection policy or a sensitivity label to a document and it's the match and the condition is not right because there are various permutations of stuff like social security numbers or in South Africa we've got a South African ID number which is 13 characters. A few things to consider and also understand how this works. And this is a great slide to talk about what can be done across the silos inside of your organization. One, you can extend this to on-prem, and I think it's important that we understand what that means in the world. Secondly, you can extend it to the apps that sit across your platforms and also extend that down to not only a Windows desktop, but also Mac, also to mobile devices. And there was a question yesterday on, I think it was Drew's session around, um, can we do sensitivity labeling on mobile apps on iOS and Android? And the answer is yes. Also understand how you can do it on containers. So you can do it at a group level, which is you can now apply a sensitivity policy as a sensitive policy to an, a Microsoft 365 group because they've, they've renamed that. No, it's no longer called an Office 365 group. You can also do it at a SharePoint document library level and also extend that across teams. So you could say this team is highly confidential and apply the same rules that you would apply to a document with a social security number to the entire team, which is super exciting. Naturally, we, we're going to talk about Exchange Online where you can apply that to mails going out. And there's also things that you can do and extend the protection when you are using MCAS, the Cloud App Security Tool, which comes at an additional license and extend it to third party SaaS apps that you might be working with. Uh, there's some stuff around uh, what you can do from a strategy perspective, how you go about doing this, start small, rinse and repeat, and extend that when you start looking at what you want to protect. So do you want to protect the containers? So is there a document library in your environment that you want to protect? Or do you just want to protect the individual document because you don't know where people are creating the document from? And it's important to understand that because some users might work on an unmanaged device, logging in with a different version of Office, and you're not going to extend that sort of security to those devices. So understand how all of that works. Uh, some benefits around doing this, um, I think the important part is being able to attract and uh, not attract, track and monitor what documents have, have been tagged so that you know what is going on and where it's being shared. Also being able to encrypt files so that if there is some form of data breach, they can't unlock the document because they don't have the de de decryption key. And then you, you can also build out the intelligence around that. And uh, and this is really where I get excited about it because based on auto classification, you are going to have to ebb and flow with how the users work with it. And there's a big adoption strategy. Yeah, I did work for a customer in New York uh, and they have, and New York has just rolled out a new, in South Africa, we talk about uh, Poppy. And in New York, there's a new cybersecurity policy that talks about personal information. It's not the PII stuff. And it's just been launched. It was done in California and it's extended to, I can't remember the policy name, but it was the same thing, right? And the minute we started switching these things on, the users were, hey, we don't like this. We don't want to auto classify. We want to control it. So understand the measurements when it does come to what level of control you can extend to your users and you're going to have to rinse and repeat, try before you buy. Moving on. There's a few things that I want to talk about with you know, the way you uh, balance security and, and productivity in the organization. And I think I've actually skipped ahead because I talked a bit about this. Now, understand a few things. Uh, what you're going to do around DLP. So how do you make sure that documents are not deleted by applying a policy? You don't necessarily want to block sharing, but you don't want the users to have the rights to delete. Also understand what it means from a, a visual markings. And a lot of deterrent is around putting confidential watermark in the document and people take that seriously. And then also understand what you need to do from a when documents are encrypted, how does the and we called it, what do we call it? That was the content access account back in the old SharePoint on-prem days. How do you enable searching for documents that have been encrypted? I know a few questions have come up uh, about 
What happens to encrypted documents when we do a tenant to tenant migration? And and I think Drew actually answered that last night saying that, well, what you need to do is make sure that you give access to those documents before you move to the new domain. And when you move it across, it's really the domain that has access to it. And all users that belong to said domain would have access to it. So just a top tip to worry about that. And that's really what I wanted to talk to you about when we when we move around protecting your content inside of your organization. Naturally, it's a journey. Um, it's not something that you can just flip a switch today and say, well, this is the default protection policy and it's been applied to all documents. Um, however, I do know of a customer that is doing that today and a mate of mine pinged me about it. But understand the difference between retention and, and, and sensitivity labeling and how that impacts what you're doing from on the back end when you are using a sensitivity label to enforce a data loss prevention policy on top of that. And it does get a bit hairy. But understand the differences. You've got to find that balance between locking down everything and not stifling productivity inside of your organization. And that's as much as I want to talk about protecting content inside of your organization. The next thing we I want to cover is, is, so once it's protected, how do we make sure that we're actually compliant? Because um, regulatory statutes, like something like the general protection, um, um, uh, the data protection regulation, the general data protection regulation um, of the EU, all 25 member states, and it's a regulation, it's not legislation, so it doesn't have to be passed by law, but you need as an organization to subscribe to that. And Microsoft has done really well when um, they started pushing through compliance to not only the Office 365 side, but to Dynamics as well as the Azure cloud from Microsoft. So what does it really mean when we talk about compliance in the Microsoft world? One, we talk about assess respond and protect. So how do we go about doing this? There's a lot of information protection and governance policies that can be done. And we're going to talk a little bit about the compliance manager and the service trust portal. And what I really liked about Microsoft now is that they bring that, and that's why you've seen this split between the security and compliance entities, that they've started bringing in all the compliance manager goodness that used to exist in and still exists in the service trust portal, but into the M365 admin center. So what it does is it gives you a bunch of templates to simplify the assessment when it comes to compliance, how to integrate things from this is the assessment part and what I need to do in order to be compliant and I can pull that through things like sensitivity labeling and retention policies for data loss prevention and also how do you respond when there are certain things that happen from a e-discovery perspective. I don't know if everyone has seen the Microsoft Compliance Score. Um, it's no longer in preview. It's actually available in the, the Compliance Center. And what's nice about this is it actually gives you a Compliance Score based on the type of assessments that you would normally run using the Compliance Manager. So it's actually brought the Compliance Manager in. And when we start talking about these assessments that can be run, all the big standards are available. We've got the GDPR assessment, and that actually breaks down the regulation from a a, a section perspective, it will tell you section A needs you to do this, this is what you need to perform. And we've also got stuff like NEST, FedRAMP, and there's some HIPAA things as well. Now, when I look and go through what it actually means, I mean, this is, we've seen this, and you'll notice under the compliance score, it gives you some sort of um, idea of what you need to adhere to and what this means and how it translates to you. And what's quite cool is when you actually go through it, you'll see that you've actually got a breakdown of the various assessments that you can run against your environment. For me, straight off the bat, run the standard data protection baseline against your environment. I mean, if you do have um, EU citizens that you engage with and you store their data, like Facebook does and everyone else, um, you can run the GDPR assessment in your environment. But you'll notice that I think there's about 30 assessments currently available that you can consume. My suggestion for you is to make sure that you run the data protection baseline. And this is one that Microsoft has created based on what the world is doing. Data Protection Act of, I think, 1996 in the UK. Um, we've seen what the GDPR is, is doing for the 25 member states in the EU, and they've merged that together to give you some form of idea of how to protect your content and what the baseline is. It's a Microsoft baseline. It, it doesn't subscribe to any sort of legislation or regulations like NIST and like FedRAMP and like HIPAA. And it's something that you can do without having to drill down too fast into that. 
when we look at it, my suggestion is run this so that you can remain compliant. And what it does is it gives you actions that you need to perform as an organization and also what Microsoft has done from a tenant perspective to make sure that they are compliant. And that's a big win for auditors when you get Campo, when you get KPMGs or the Deloitte's of the world coming into your organization to audit you, you can actually show them this and show them that you are compliant. And these are the activities and the things that you've put in place inside of the organization. It's not just a document that says cybersecurity policy anymore. And I want to use an example when we start talking about the GDPR dashboard and Microsoft has actually invested in building out a dashboard for this. You're not going to get a NIST dashboard because it doesn't work in the same way. But what's quite cool about this, if you are storing EU citizen data, and remember from an EU citizen perspective, they have the right to be forgotten, they have the right to dispute um, content that's been stored and they've got the right to mitigate the content and ask you to remove content and also give it to them in a specific way because you've got to export the content, right? And there's a call, well, they call it a DSR. Um, there's a DSR portal inside of the compliance center that actually allows you to see these data subject requests from whoever's requested it and you can then use, and we're going to talk about discovery in a bit, uh, you can use the e-discovery tooling to actually go find data for that data subject inside of your organization and naturally export it so that you can give it to the subject or the data subject, the EU citizen that is contesting data inside of your organization. So I'm not going to take up too much of your time about that. Now, naturally, we've talked about what compliance looks like. We talked about how you go about protecting content inside of the environment, but how do you find this content? And there's a few reasons why we would want to do it. One, I alluded to that when we looked at uh, what a data subject request is, and it's the same tooling. And I think it's important to understand that Microsoft is really, really good at providing you and in South Africa, Carl will probably get this. We talk about the Jacques Callis of cricket. And Jacques Callis is the world's best all-rounder in cricket. Now, naturally, that's what Microsoft is really good at doing, and we've seen them become much better at it over the last five years. You don't have to go buy an extra tool, right? So for MFA, you don't have to go buy ping. You can use MFA inside of um, Azure. It's the same for content protection. You don't have to go buy an external tool from OpenText to do rights management inside of your organization and so forth. So. And it's the same with this. And that's why they glue it together. You've seen, we, I talked about sensitivity labels and how you can apply a data loss prevention policy using a sensitivity label or using a retention label. And that's integrated from multiple sources. It's the same of how we can bring in compliance from how we can apply a NIST policy to a document that says this document is highly confidential, you can't delete it, and it rolls back up into the compliance center. Naturally, we want to be able to use the same e-discovery tools that we have available to us for other things, not just around litigation. So let's have a look at what that could possibly be. Now, where the world was, um, collecting data out of Office 365, and we used to export that to a third-party tool, and a lot of companies still have those third-party tools that they need to use when it comes to archiving and compliance. And in today's world, and you'll notice that this slide is quite old, um, so the rolled out part is, and I'm going to talk about custodian management and how you can do redaction. Very excited about the redaction stuff, um, which is quite cool because you're going to have to protect sensitive information. And this is really, and, and I'll give you the slides, and this is why I put this one in here, to understand where the world is from an analytics perspective, how you can automatically tag things. And remember, we talked about tagging, auto-labeling, auto same process, and also the analytics. So can we report and remediate on this and react on the data that we've actually worked through. So where does it start? It's really about reducing the risk and being able to put legal holes. It's about looking at the advanced side of things when it comes to analytics and also how you can annotate a document before you need to export it when it comes to stuff like data subject reports and also it extends beyond uh, litigation. And we're no longer just limited to what's in a mailbox. We can extend it. The extensibility is so great that you can actually extend it to third party applications as well. So you can uh, go and do an e discovery to your SAS into your SAS applications as well. Uh, there were talk, there was talk about extending it to stuff like uh, Dropbox, Box, and Boxy. 
Um, I'm not too sure if they have gotten to that point already. So let's go through this. Uh, data collection and content processing is important. So how do you actually crawl? What you, is available to you? How you can actually manage that? And I'm not going to drill down to the, the nitty gritty, but you can create a case typically or an investigation and actually collect that data. And we'll talk about working sets in a bit. And also what it supports, it extends across your entire landscape. It's, and Microsoft calls their apps first class citizens. So it will drill down all the way into something like streams. So think about using Teams and being able to conduct a meeting. And there might be some form of deformation in a meeting that's now recorded that's sitting inside a stream. You can now when you start looking at transcribing that data, so you can search, it will transcribe the audio and you'll be able to search on the text inside of it. So that's very, very cool, especially when you're doing litigation or you're worrying about what people are doing inside of your organization and the conversations that have been had. The next thing which I'm very excited about is that you do not have to have your IT team do this. You can assign a custodian, which might be someone from your legal department that can actually go through this and filter through that working sets of data. The other thing is it also helps when you start working with those working sets about filtering through the data. And we talked to a customer about a year ago that uh, each litigation hold process was costing them about uh, 10 to $20,000 a pop because what they did was they took all the data for that specific um, hold that they actually ran on the, uh, someone inside of the organization, three, 400 pages, and they gave it across to the legal team, which is an external counsel. And they had to get a bunch of people to sift through that and they'd end up with 27 documents that are relevant. You can now apply that upfront before you export it and then export the content to the, the legal team when you bring in a custodian to help you go through all of that. Um, naturally, you want to be able to do some cool stuff. And also, this is the really cool part is where you can apply redaction so that that custodian can actually work through the document and make sure that sensitive information is not exposed. And that's really, really cool when you start using e-discovery in conjunction with um, litigation. And I'm running um, low on time. But this is really when we start looking at how we go about discovering content in your organization. And I mean, you don't have to really draw down to document redaction in this case, but if you want to run some form of e-discovery to find what users are doing inside of your organization, you can also use the same tooling. And the message from me is it's the same tooling. There's a, just a different lens being applied. You can use it for litigation. You can use it for complex searches. You can use it for compliance. It's the same tooling. It's just got a different lens. And I love the fact that from a litigation perspective, you can actually use this. You can apply a case, um, spin up a case, apply a hold, and then extend this around annotations and redactions inside of documents because you want to highlight specifics that are required. And it reduced your overall cost of litigation inside of your organization. Everyone good? And this is what I hate about live meetings. I don't get that uh, responsiveness from, from people that are talking. Um, you don't get that interaction. All right, moving on because I'm, I'm burning daylight here. The last thing I want to talk about is managing access to this world. So we looked at how do you protect content with content in the cloud. We also looked at how you remain compliant with that content that's in the cloud. And we've also shown you how to go about finding content inside of your organization by using tools like eDiscovery. Now, it doesn't matter about those things. Forget the first three um, things we talked about. If you don't manage access control into your organization, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter because if anyone can get in, it's your big thing. So, so how do we go about looking at, it's great to say apply protection actions, but how do we provide access restrictions inside of your organization? Now, let's understand what the differences are because I want to talk about authentication and authorization. So generally, authentication is something you know, it's your password, having a device for MFA so that um, you can say that you are, and in the old days we called it claims-based authentication or duck typing, because if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck and it looks like a duck, chances are it is a duck. And you've seen in today's world, you can use a biometric fingerprint reader for those who have access control um, into your buildings and also Microsoft has got Windows Hello where it will scan your face and you've seen it on on your iOS devices and everyone like Liu later on, on, on Unbox Therapy, um, how quick they can actually use a, 
facial detection um, to unlock a device. So that's authenticating you as a user. The next thing is really about what level of authorization do you have access to? Apps, data, and the access levels, right? But it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing because in the old days, we used to see companies try to hack your password and it's great and everyone knows that they need to make sure that the password is 12 uh, letters long and you've got to have an uppercase and a lowercase and weird uh, special characters and all of those things. But it really doesn't matter because it's not so much about the password. I mean, the password, you can spoof an access point, provide them with a portal.office.com login details and boom, you're in, right? You're literally in, so it's no longer just a bot, a bot password management. I mean, password management is the thing that you shouldn't care about. It's really about switching on things like MFA. And when we look at um, conditional access inside of, of, of Office 365, as well as uh, the larger Microsoft 365, and also where it extends to, to, to Azure, it's important to understand it's one thing switching on MFA, right? Multi-factor authentication, great. I get a text or I can use an authenticator app for two-factor authentication. But we can extend that based on various things. One, who the user is, or what role they have in the organization. Is the device compliant? So if my notebook explodes and I grab my son's notebook and I'm logging on from that, but it's not a managed device. What sort of risk profiling do I extend? It's the same with physical and virtual locations, right? If I'm sitting at the coffee shop in the Ukraine, am I going to allow that user to access that? Right? And it's really about building those policies and also understanding what the risk profile is and then what level of access are we going to extend to that? I mean, something as simple as if I have users physically in my office building, they shouldn't have to use MFA because it's a, from a so pure location. But if they're sitting at that coffee shop in the Ukraine, switch on MFA. And those are things, and you can build out these baseline security policies that says, if suspicious activity is detected, I mean, I use a VPN, I'm in South Africa, I have a DNS proxy because I want to access Netflix programs from the US. I mean, we've all seen this, I think we've all done it. And actually, if I access my content from my desk at home where I'm sitting at right now, this should, it should pick up that I'm routing through India. And I should, my Office 365 and my Azure tenant should pick up where I'm logging in from and it should flag that and say, hey, we don't trust you because you're not logging in from a secure location. Do something with it. Enable MFA or block access to downloading content from your environment. And understand how this extensibility and we, we often miss what conditional access means just from Azure. And this extends obviously to your applications that are sitting inside of your Office 365 or your Microsoft 365 tenant. And you can pull these reports through Cloud App Security or MCAS, and that's part of your M365 subscription if you buy the right licenses. And you can extend this to applications that are running on-prem. I've two things you need to do. Flip the switch for MFA. Get your users using that and then have a look at what you can do from a conditional access perspective because the permutations of rules that you can build out is so extensive that it becomes very complex and um, less is more in this case. Don't make it too complex. But the nice thing about this is, oh, thirdly, uh, block legacy application, uh, legacy authentication. MFA, conditional access, block legacy authentication. Those are my tips around um, managing access inside of your organization. So just to have a look at what's available there. There are some baseline policies. Um, so there's a security baseline that you can flip and switch it on. It will do MFA, it will do conditional access, and it will also do um, modern authentication for applications just on that blocking legacy authentication. There is an option about modern auth inside of the M365 admin center under org wide settings. Even though you enable blocking le legacy authentication from conditional access policies as part of your baseline security policy inside of the Azure portal, you still need to go into the M365 admin center or guide settings, click modern auth and tick that box because modern auth doesn't automatically extend it to the exchange that's running inside of your Office 365 tenant. So be very wary of that. Okay, what else do we have? 
at sea. And what's nice about the other things that you can look at is uh, what sort of information you get. And remember, I talked about monitoring. You want to monitor and understand what's going on when it comes to risks. So you can also have a look at a sign-in risk. Like I said earlier on, I had a, 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 someone log in to an environment whose um, uh, their account was compromised, and I could see the sign-in risk has been flagged as high. And, and that's how I found out about it. Did a password reset, forced some few things down to, to uh, some few things. Is that an actual? That sounds like such a South African thing to talk about. Some few things, but know how you can actually start managing not only from an application level. So what's happening from a risk perspective inside Teams? or SharePoint or OneDrive or Plan or Stream. Also understand what happens when a user is at risk based on where they're signing in from. And obviously this comes in at a price, so make sure that you have a look at what's available when. Um, if you are an E1, then you will have the base stuff and there are different SKUs. You get the free um, um, Azure policies and then you get an, an, a, the premium licenses for P1 and P2. Understand how that impacts you. So you don't necessarily have to go from an E1 to an E3 or an E3 to an E5. You can actually just buy these individual Intune licenses or EM plus S licenses. You don't have to necessarily upgrade them. My suggestion is to speak to someone that understands licensing because it becomes very complex, like auto labeling. If you want to apply a default policy, a default policy to every document that your users create inside of your organization, you do not need to buy a, a bigger plan because you're not auto classifying it. You're applying a default policy. It's a big difference. Auto classification re requires a condition in order to auto apply a label. A default policy is not a condition. You're saying for every document, you need this baseline security policy. I also understand that when you start looking at sensitivity labeling, um, you need to make sure that you're running the latest version of Office Pro Plus. Someone can't come in there with Office 2016 and expect that uh, protection icon to be available, the classification or sensitivity labeling of icon to be available to them. Also understand that it's baked now into the Office, Office 365 Pro Plus or your Office desktop client. You no longer have to deploy the Azure Information Protection labeling for that unless you are using AIP exclusively. So there is a difference between sensitivity labeling and what you're doing inside of the Azure Information Protection Portal. Next up, this is just a gratuitous slide because um, I know a lot of people don't enjoy this topic because it's about protection and security and there's few of us in the world that actually really, really drill down. Uh, guys like Michael Knoll and Drew Madelang uh, spends a lot of time in this world around security. My takeaways, um, make sure what you that you understand what the benefits are of working through uh, Microsoft information protection, because it's not just about locking down the content. It's about extending that to what the user is doing on their desktop. Very important because you can apply a label to a user storing a document on their C drive. It's, and we're working in a different, um, not working in the office version that you want them to work in. Uh, understand what it means when you start doing um, co-authoring and high labels, sensitivity labels are actually applied at that level. Understand how you can broad-based apply some sort of restriction, access control, and sensitivity from a confidentiality perspective across containers like Microsoft Teams, like SharePoint, even to Power BI. And also understand what the rich analytics are available to you because Microsoft spends a plethora of money. I think they spent a billion dollars last year just on security and understanding what's going on in the world of security and protection. So they have spent the money to give you the right options at the right time and the right suggestions. Like with, if you go to the security center and go look at the um, secure score, it will actually tell you is a nice benchmark against industry verticals that you can actually see what other organizations secure score are from around the world in order to get your baseline security up to scratch so that you are comparative to what's happening in other industry verticals that spend time in your world. So it's really about rinse and repeat. Start with, start with a, a small user group um, when applying conditional access rolling out MFA, understanding what sensitivity looks like, and also understanding what it means to be compliant inside of your organization. Know that there are two security, well, there are two admin centers that's been split. 
It's finally available. It's G8. Make sure that you understand what this means. And actually, when you click on the security center, your current tenant it takes you to the old security and compliance center. And there's a little ribbon on the top that says the two split out. You will see in the admin center, it says security and then it says compliance. The compliance one will go to compliance.microsoft.com. The security one still, I think, goes to protection.microsoft.com until you click on the link that will take you to security.microsoft.com. Understand the difference between the two. I have included some resources here, so when we circulate the slide deck, you can actually go through this. And I think I've 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 hit my number right. It's it's 50 minutes after the hour. Um, if you need anything from me, thank you for your time. Uh, please rate the session. We'd